Hi, I'm Dweezil Zappa, and this is Guitar Power. Today we're talking with Wayne Kramer. Wayne, how are you? Welcome. Couldn't be better, thanks. Happy to be here. I would love to find out what happened. How did the guitar become your instrument of choice? It actually wasn't my instrument of choice. I started with the drums. Okay. When I was a kid, I went to camp. They had a snare drummer who would play a rhythm, and we would all march down to the chow hall for breakfast in the morning. Yeah. And all the boys are like, ah, this is cool. <laughs> so I wanted to be a drummer. But then Elvis was emerging, and, yeah. and uh, I thought, well, the guitar players are up front, and they would probably get more girls. You know? And I wanted some of that <laughs> attention. You know? So the guitar became the object of my uh, obsession. So can you play the first few things that like, made you go, yes, I'm getting this. This is for me. In Detroit, they have these uh, restaurants. They, they're called Coney Islands. And there was one in my neighborhood, and they had this Seaberg jukebox, and Dwayne Eddy's Rebel Rouser was on it. And when I heard that tone, it... <laughs> and it just went... Blah, 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 blah. And I was attracted to the sound of the electric guitar, not the yeah. acoustic guitar. Was that one of the first songs that you, you set oh, out to yeah. learn? There was another Dwayne Eddy song called uh, Ramrod. So it was more of the sound uh, and what was happening. Like there was an attitude that it seems you were attracted to. Yeah, the, the, the music that I was drawn to was to me the sound of liberation, a way to not end up on the assembly line at Ford's, you know. And in the sound of the electric guitar, I, I heard the future, you know, I heard a liberation. I heard a way for me to reinvent myself. At a certain point, you became an innovator in the sound of music. You had this energy uh, and attitude in your playing that was different. And some people say, oh, it's the precursor to punk rock, but I don't, I don't feel, like, do you feel that? Like, No, I, I never really got it because, I mean, I understand what punk means and Beethoven was a punk, you know, yeah. uh, and, and Cecil Taylor is a punk, you know, and Train mm -hmm. was a punk in that sense of, yeah. you know, rejecting the, the art forms from the generation before you mm -hmm. and finding your own sound. I get that, what the MC5 was doing compared to, you know, the Sex Pistols or the Ramones or the LA punk bands. I never really got the connection because it seemed to me what most of those bands were doing, we had already done better. How did you get that voice? Like, how did you get from Dwayne Eddy to super fuzz tone, aggro, let me, let me stick it to the man kind of, you know, <laughs> like well, what happened? You know, the ventures were a big uh, part of my um, baptism, you know. Um, and, and some of the other uh, guitar players of the day, Lonnie Mack and, and Freddie King. Mm -hmm. uh, Albert Collins was a huge influence on me. I mean, just the tone and this biting attack that he had, just the way he would place things his rhythmically was stronger than a lot of other yeah. uh, guitar players I heard. But the funny thing is all the people that you mention as your biggest influences are not visible in the sound of the MC5's no. first record. We gravitated to certain kinds of music, and we used to call it drive. Okay. Very Detroit of us. Yeah. You know, it was music that had kind of a rhythmic forward motion, you yeah. know, it was moving ahead. Right after that first wave came um, these other bands and guitarists like Jeff Beck and Pete Townsend. Right. And, and the stuff I was working on, you know, I, I was experimenting with playing amps too loud yeah. because it, I could get sustain. Right. I could get a note to ring out longer, you know, and make it sound like a violin maybe. Mm -hmm. And they were doing it too, you know, so they, they became like my contemporary, my peers and my competition, you yeah. know, like, uh, like whatever they're doing, I want to be able to do that yeah. better than they're doing it. But the, the real breakthrough was you know, we'd gone through guys that tried to manage the MC5, and this right. was always a disaster, because we were unmanageable. <laughs> we were insane. And um, we met uh, John Sinclair. 
he turned me on to free jazz. He turned me on to Train and Albert Eiler and Sun Ra. And all of a sudden, I heard where to go from Chuck Berry. And I heard it in Albert Eiler. I heard it in Train, you know, like that you could go beyond the beat, beyond the key that you could actually just make sounds out of the guitar rather than worrying about notes in a scale or in a mode. Starship, for example, mm -hmm. you know. There's elements of that song that it's just feedback and noise mm -hmm. that, that becomes the soundtrack. Yeah, you know, we're listening to Ascension and, and you know, live at Birdland and, and we want to emulate our heroes, you know. Yeah. So we did away with the beat and the key and everything is just, you know. But the song had way more structure well, than that. Well, it had a structure, it, yeah. yeah. It was kind of a, a um, homage to our hero, Sun Ra. Starts as a rock song. Uh, can you hear me? It's and then like, it modulates, you right. know, in the solar system, leaving the solar system, leaving. Kind of um, the, the uh, audio track to a rocket launch and, yeah. and then uh, we leave gravity and we, we're in space. At that time, what kind of equipment were you using to get the, that tone on that record? It started with the little amps that we had in the beginning, you know, yeah. little Epiphones uh -huh. and, uh, you know, if you just cranked them all, the, you didn't have any choice, you have to yeah. crank it all the way to be heard right. as amps got more powerful. I mean, Fender Dual Showman was the most powerful amp of its day then. Yeah. We saw these Vox amps that the Beatles had, yeah. and there was a Vox distributor in Detroit, and we talked this guy into signing for a loan to buy us some gear. So we got Vox Super Beatles. Me and Fred Smith had them. These are 100 watt tube amps. Yeah. And they had a switch on the top for playing in different countries in Europe to uh -huh. change the voltage. And if you turned it all the way on 220, you could get this great distortion, you know. <laughs> They probably didn't like running at 220 in America, though. Uh, did you have blow those things up? Or? All the time. Yeah. Yeah, smoke, blue smoke would yeah. come in. Which was the... good to see on stage. Yeah. People were like, yeah, what a show. <laughs> All right, love it. Those got um, repossessed because, of course, we never made the payments on yeah. the loan. And then finally, we got, I think, nine Marshall heads because you'd have, like, two on tour and one in the shop all yeah. the time. You'd have to keep rotating them yeah. around. And they really... They were ungodly loud. I mean, it was, there were nights when I knew it was too loud. So that's punishing volume. Yeah. What kind yep. of pickups were in the guitar? Well, like this, this guitar uh -huh. is a reproduction of the Stratocaster I used back in the day. And I put this humbucker in there so I would have just a little more power than Fred Smith yeah. for my solos. Yeah. Just something to get my solos out just a little bit yeah. in front. Yeah. Because we would hot rod the guitars. We'd put um, a Gibson pickups in them because they were known to be the, yeah. the louder pickups. That sound of those guitars on there is just over the top, mm -hmm. fuzz, crunch. Was there an epiphany moment where you played something and you said, yes, this is who I am as a guitar player? Like you found your voice. I'm constantly trying to find my voice, That's you great. know. After the MC5 broke up, I lost my way and uh, really embraced a criminal uh, perspective on existence mm -hmm. and um, ended up uh, serving a federal prison term. And while I was in prison, I happened to be there at a time where a jazz trumpeter was in the same facility as me. His name was Red Rodney. And Red replaced Miles Davis as the trumpet player in the Charlie Parker Quintet. This guy was almost everything I ever wanted to be. I mean, he was a dope fiend jazz musician. <laughs> and he had no use for the free jazz movement because he was a hardcore bebopper. I mean, Red played at a level of accomplishment that trumpet players don't play at. I mean, when he first got to the prison, I went up to him and I said, hey, uh, you're Red Rodney, I'm Wayne Kramer. Yeah, yeah, I lead the band here in the prison and you know, maybe we could play together. And he said, yeah, yeah, we'll see. And I thought, fuck this guy, you know, we'll yeah. see, you know. And one day he came over to my house and he had a jazz fake book in his yeah. horn and he said, can you read these chords? And I said, yeah, I, I, I guess, yeah. yeah. He said, all right, uh, 
Or we're going to play this one here. You know, I butchered him, I'm yeah. sure, you know, and he played the melody and he said, oh yeah, you can play. And he opened up to me and he became my musical father and my mentor. He taught me a, uh, the first uh, Berklee School of Music course in writing and arranging. Oh, cool. So it was my first exposure to music theory. You know, I went into prison a, a pretty adventurous rock guitar player and came out I think a competent musician. Well, I enjoyed talking to you about guitars well, and everything so else. Much, Thank man. you, Wayne. We'll do it again. Thanks.